Welcome back, wannabes and creators, to The Complete Creative, the podcast that helps you make the best work of your life and share it with the world. And this is it. This is the first new episode of my podcast in two years. And I thought it appropriate to do an interview with myself about what's changed in the past two years. So I brought on my very good friend, Tyler James, to interview me. Now, is that narcissistic? I don't know. It's my show, so I get to do what I want. Plus, I think you'll enjoy it. I think it's really important for you guys to know where I'm coming from, what's happened in the past two years, and why I thought this was the right time to bring this show back. Next week, I'll have a brand new guest on the show, Marv Wolfman. Legendary creator, created the Teen Titans, wrote for Marvel, DC, Epic Mickey 2, and just about anything under the sun. He wrote the tie-in novel for Suicide Squad and hundreds of comics. In fact, I think he's the number two person underneath Stan Lee for most characters turned into a movie or TV show. So that's next week. But this week, Tyler James from the Comics Launch Podcast is interviewing moi. If you don't know Tyler James, he is the publisher and founder of the Comics Tribe Publishing Company, publishes Red 10, Wailing Blade, Sync, and a whole bunch of other great comics. He's also the host of the Comics Launch Podcast, which shows comic creators how to make more successful Kickstarters. I've been on his show a bunch of times. He's a dear friend of mine, and I'm so excited that he agreed to come on my show and interview me about being a complete creative. This was the Lynchpin Show. We've been trying to schedule times for months. First, it was Comic-Con, then New York Comic-Con, my Kickstarter, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But we finally got this in the can. And I'm so excited for how this turned out. I think it's a great representation of what you can expect in the show. And I can't wait for you to hear everything that's happened to me since this show went off the air. If you like this show, go show Tyler some love. Go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the Comics Launch Podcast. And while you're there, you could subscribe to The Complete Creative too. And if you're more of a reader, head on over to thecompletecreative.com and check out our blog, epic blog posts, free courses, and a whole lot more. All right, now let's get on with the show. It's very weird to be asked what I'm passionate about these days, but here it is. Take it away, me. Tell us what you're passionate about these days. Well, I'm really passionate about searching out the question, um... Like, how do you do this for 40 years? I, I, uh, I, like, it's almost an all-consuming question for me. Obviously, I'm, I'm still writing and doing all of that stuff. But for the, the purposes of this discussion, the thing that has always fascinated me since I gave up the, sh the, the show, even before I gave up the show, I think it has started to eat away, is, um, you know, the, I, I started the show with the question, how do you break in to do the thought? How do you actually become successful doing this? It seemed like an impossibility. And as I started doing the show, I would learn trick, tricks and tips and secrets. And then I would like, amalgamate them into my own practice. And eventually like I did broke th break through. I became successful. You know, I've been doing this now full time for uh, a few years now. And uh, it's what started to weigh on me as I as I continued on was just like how do you keep doing this for for thirty more years, forty more years? You know, even uh, uh, you know thirty years, I'd only be sixty seven, so it wouldn't be like a, a, absurd to do this for thirty or even forty more years. Um, especially with uh, you know forty more years, I'd be just over the median uh, life expectancy of a adult male in America right now. So 
it's it's I it's it started to become daunting. It's like you know I'm 37 now. I was probably 35, four or 35 when this started to start haunting me. It's like you're probably going to be doing this for double the time you've been alive now. And I was so tired. I was I'm so tired. Uh, like at that time of like just burning the candle at every end for you know years that I just had no idea how someone could like. 30 years from now still be doing the thing that I was doing and it started to fascinate me and boggle me and those are the conversations that I've really been having a lot since I since the show originally went off the air and those are the kind of conversations that uh, you plan to bring on this new incarnation which is uh, the complete creative is that uh, that what we're in for yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I I obviously know that a lot of the people that listen to the show are like young and new creatives who haven't broken through yet, or even, you know, I'm a relatively successful uh, author, so I uh, probably even uh, people that don't even do books. So I want to make sure it's like relevant for them as well. But the question that I think will drive this show going forward is like, how do you live a complete life as a creative when you're not just trying to break in? You know, when you're trying to break in, it's almost, I don't want to say it's easier, but because you have that sort of glass ceiling, you're always trying to go through, uh, there's always like another step. There's always something, but eventually, you know, I mean, there's still places for me to go. I'm not saying that I've made it in there or anything yet, but like there's, there's far less steps and they're far more complicated with every step, with every level you gain that going to the next level is so much harder and more complicated that you're not seeing that gain every day or every week or even maybe every year. You know, you're you're working on more complicated projects. You're working on more collaborations. You're just you're doing more things that take a lot longer, and it's it becomes a lot uh, more difficult to keep that drive. You know, when you first start, there's always that drive of like nobody wants like. No, like you can almost keep going from spite alone, right? But when you are when you've gotten some level of success, you're almost like floating out in the ether of space and going like, okay, like, wow, the next planet is like forty forty years away. Like, how how do I have the propulsion to just get me to that place? As opposed to just as as opposed to like the mechanics of being there. Cause even if you know the mechanics of how to get from like earth to Mars, you've still got to traverse that distance. And it's, it feels almost like hauntingly impossible to me at this moment. Well, that's, I think a great conversations that need to be had in this space, because I mean, the reality is there are people out there that have built these wonderful careers for years and years and years, but I am also positive that um, many of them have had their moments where it's like, wow, you know, <laughs> wouldn't anything else out there be easier to do than this? Um, so I want to I want to dive into that. I want to dive into a lot. But um, I, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners that maybe were listeners before or perhaps new listeners that are discovering this. And they may have some obvious uh, questions for you. Um, the, the last incarnation of this podcast was uh, the business of art, um, and you ran from, I believe, January 2016 to November 2017, uh, and then um, you decided to put it on hiatus or, or put it on pause or, or, or walk away from it. And so uh, one of the big questions is, why did you stop the podcast a couple of years ago? Well, there were a couple of reasons. Uh, the first was um, monetization. Uh, I just had no mechanism to uh, monetize the show, and Unfortunately, it was I was doing so much other stuff that was making me money. It made it impossible to carve out like a day a week. This show takes a day of of, of every week because I have to do the I have to record it, then I have to edit it, and then um, even when I, if I hire somebody out, it still takes time. I have to go back and then listen to it once it's edited. Um, I have to book the guest. I have to prepare the questions for the guest. So it takes. I mean, on a and, and then. There's something weird about recording audio where, like, I am so tired at the end of it. Even though I'm just sitting at the end. Do you get that, too? Are you an introvert or an extrovert? I'm probably much more intro extroverted than introverted. Interesting. Yeah, I, I do wonder. Um, I wonder if it's something about just sitting down at the at the 
um, just in fr- but without being in person. Like, I, I wonder if like if you were in person and having these conversations as an extrovert, if that would be uh, if that would energize you as opposed to totally, totally wipe you out. Um, f- I mean, for, for me, yeah, I, I can definitely have a thing where like like last couple of weeks ago, I had, I think, uh, I don't know, two dozen uh, coaching calls in the span of about eight days. And I'm an, I'm an introvert in that when, like, when I'm like engaging in conversation and everything, I, I enjoy it in the moment, but it does wipe me. And so like that would totally like knock me for a loop. Um, cause I'm not used to, even though I've been podcasting once a week, every week and doing live streams and things like that, wasn't used to talking at that level of depth for that long. So, and, and I know, uh, in looking at all of the guests that you had, uh, you know, you dove deep and you asked intros- introspective questions. And so, so yeah, there, there was a lot of work to it. So I, I can understand someone as someone that has um, done, you know, now 220 podcasts uh, in a row uh, for the comics launch podcast. You know, I, I know how much work does go into it. Um, even if you do have someone uh, in my case, I have, I have Brant that once I'm done recording, he takes it over and, you know, a week later or 10, uh, a couple of days later, it's, it's live. And so, so I actually, you know, <laughs> I'll admit, I don't go and listen to everything, all the podcasts after it's done from the editor. I've, uh, I trust Brant and, and actually he's, he's made me look pretty good. Cause he, he even, he, he goes through and listens to them all and, and he catches, uh, some mistakes that I make that would make me look dumber than, uh, <laughs> that I'd want. Um, so, you know, well, so I, and I wanted that. Yeah. That would be one tip for, for you is just find someone that you trust. Um, and also, um, structure, 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 structure. Uh, we have a detailed checklist that is sort of like your operation guide that just check all the boxes. Don't miss skip any steps steps. And that drastically reduces the, um, the chance that something isn't uh, doesn't go through the way that, that you want yeah and i want something like that and i also wanted to do ads and all of these things and like that requires money and i needed it to be st- at least have a mechanism to for it to be self-sustaining and i didn't have that when i first started i did had no idea that it would go for as long as it did i would be i was happy if it had gone 100 episodes and we hit that in like the first nine months because i was doing two sometimes three episodes a week and so uh, about uh, like a year, maybe a year and a couple months into the show, I just was like, I need, I I need some help, and I couldn't, I didn't have a mechanism in place to like make that because uh, the second reason is because the sh- the show was named totally wrong. <laughs> um, most people thought that it was a podcast for fine art until they listened to it. Um, and so uh, many people found me and I did some interviews with fine artists. Um, and it wasn't only for fine art or artists and all. In fact, most of the guests were writers or other kinds of creatives. So, um, uh, the third reason being that the business of art, when you look at it uh, and you type it out, it looks like the business of fart. And I got sick of that joke. Like after the thousandth time that someone thought it was fun to like say it. So, and the final reason was I just – I started to feel like every interview was a repetition of the one before it because of how I had structured the show and the question that I was asking. I thought I had answered it, but the question that I wanted to answer was like how do you break in? And I think if you listen to those first 150 episodes, you will find like the way to break in. Like it's, 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 I think it's contained there. It's contained better in the in – the, uh, I think in the courses that I've done since then and in the blog that I've done since then and set up. So, so just to, just to uh, put a a fine point on that, if you had to break down and and condense your, and I'm putting you on the spot, I know, but uh, if you had to condense the last 150, whatever episodes of the business of art into a, 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 as simple as you could possibly make it, you know, three step or five step plan to break in, what would you say? Sure. Well, I mean, I do have a course on this subject called Build a Rabid Fan Base, but um, the first step is to know the exact human that you want to, to write for. And that's that becomes broken into a couple more steps because a lot of people when they first start have no idea who they're writing for or like what they're what they're what they're making or why they want to make it. 
So uh, and before you even get there, you need to make a whole bunch of stuff and like know that you're going to be bad at the beginning and like start developing your taste over time. So develop your taste over time is sort of making great content. That's the first um, that's the first step and the first part of the build a rap, um, uh, how to build your creative career book, which I released a couple of years ago. So make something great would be the first step. Um, because if you can't make something great, then you can't hope to compete against Stephen King and, and Mike Mignola and Picasso and all of those people. Um, you have to know how to make at least something good and saleable um, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that you can put against those and at least approximate the same level of competency. It doesn't have to be the same level of competency, but especially when you're first starting, but it has to be like your taste has to be good and your uh, talent has to be good and your skill level has to be good. It's like a, any other craftsman. Um, you have to, or any craftsman at all, you have to be able to make the product at a level that someone will be willing to buy it at. Mm hmm Unless you're an amateur and you just want to stay an amateur and then like, go nuts, do whatever you want. I'm talking specifically to people who actually want to make this a career. Um, and then the next step is to know who you are talking to and who you want to talk to at a very deep and granular level. So uh, this involves like going out and finding people who are enjoying your work and talking to them and like building sort of a profile of – I don't like the 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 uh, the, the whole like forty five year old uh, uh, divorced mother of two like that level of detail, but I do like the level of detail where you're talking about like the the feelings that you that the work it gets and the kind of stuff that re that that it resonates with that 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 uh, like the at least the adjectives that describe your perfect customer. When talking about wannabe press, when we developed Melissa the wannabe. Now we were talking to like rebellious, anti-authority, creative, artistic, um, no nonsense, pragmatic humans, uh, and that ended up being a, like generally like a somewhere between twenty-eight and thirty-three-year-old uh, woman uh, who was college educated, but it didn't always end up as that profile. But it very often ended up as that profile when we were going to shows. Um, and so that uh, is would be step two. And then once you know that person, you have to go, you have to make stuff for them. So that the first group and in step one, you may not have been consciously making stuff for this person. So now it's time to have product market fit. So you're trying to use that, uh, use your, your audience or your little audience to figure out what they really want and then make stuff that they will like. And then once you're doing that, you know, once you have a product in a market, uh, 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 you're now it's just about scaling. So once you are reliably taking a product and making it for somebody and making money off of that thing, the last step really is 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 scaling that. And the last step is the one that takes forever because scaling could be making new products for them, like a bunch more products. It certainly means finding more of them. But finding more of them could be doing ads. It could be going to more shows. It could be, um, it could be doing cross promotions. It could be working with a publisher or other person to get to get better distribution. It could be doing international. It could be translations if you're doing books. It, there's all sorts of things that um, that scaling part has. But if I had to break it down, it would be uh, make stuff that's great. Find the person you're making for, make stuff for them. So use them as a test case and like sort of build stuff with them in mind and then scale at the end. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a great framework. Um, just because I, I have to stay on brand, I, I would slip in in between the scale and the making the thing is to actually have a launch mechanism, have a, a process that, the, that you go through to bring to, uh, where you this thing that you made and this this audience that you've been cultivating uh that's great but literally just putting something you know on your website um is, uh, in today's day and age when there's millions of things out there um is is not going to translate that into sales like being able to create an event around um your product launches um is is definitely a, sort of one of those key steps i think that um 
that's it that's in there and 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 then scaling that is is great so i don't know like as sure i would i would i would account for that in two and three but it is good to pull it out it is the last chapter of the how to build a creative career book is all about launching i didn't even have that book until the very end of the um of my time in um in at the business of art but actually the the book and the entire complete creative site is based upon exactly what we're talking about. It, it's, it was do a bunch of episodes of shows, figure out what I'm doing, then figure out who I was talking to, who was like in that audience, then make, I make, I made books and like courses and all sorts of stuff with that person in mind and then launch those courses and then scale it. Like that's, it's all in that same, uh, that set same framework that I laid out and then you added. I do like you do have to have that launch mechanism in place because that's where you see so many people um, have really big web comics or really big uh, in influencer profiles and then never be able to make money on it because they're they're worried they're they're worried about the numbers and not the actual number that matters. When I talk about social media, it doesn't matter uh, what the mechanic is. Uh, of like how many likes or shares or retweets uh, what matters is like how many people at the end of the day are buying the product because so many people will almost everybody will eventually burn out if they're not able to monetize what they're making almost I, I, I and, and by by burning out it may not be giving up completely but it will certainly be doing it much less only doing it in their spare time, you know, not doing as big a product as they want. I've never met somebody who could maintain interest at the same level as they did uh, for 20 years unless they're able to make money at that thing because the money that you're making, if you're doing it right, is, is tied very tightly to how big and influential your audience is. And generally, when you have a big audience, if you can figure out how to make the launch event happen correctly, like you will make money on that audience. And the bigger the audience, the more money you will make. It is not always the case. Uh, sometimes people have huge audiences and they just can't monetize it at all for some reason. But if you've done it properly, you can then take that, st that, that money and then make new stuff and get more people excited about it. And whether you want to make money on, a, on, on what you're doing or not, I've never heard somebody say that they don't want more people to appreciate what they're doing. And when you're not able to make money on something, uh, it, it almost always, if not always, leads to you believing that that product is not any good. And, and that may not be true. What might be true is you're launching at the wrong time in the wrong place. You're not putting the right money behind it. You're launch launching the wrong product so you don't know your audience properly or some other mechanism. But so many people then give up because they're not able to monetize the work. And while I do believe that you should be able to do things without monetizing it, like if you want to just go dance for fun or whatever, then you should be able to do that. Or even write for fun, you should be able to do that. But um, I'm talking about a very specific group of people who want to make this a career. And I still believe that if someone was dancing and that was a thing that they loved, they would be able to do it more often and with more precision and with a higher quality if they were able to put more into it. And if they were able to put more into it, that, that would come from being able to have some mechanism to make money so at least it can self-sustain the, 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 the cost of the classes and such. Definitely. And so... I mean, one of the things, one of the benefits of you taking a break from podcasting is it did free you up with, uh, as you said, like an extra day in every week, uh, at least. And uh, you put that time <laughs> into good use. You've not exactly been uh, quiet or sitting on your hands in the time since the last show ended and this new show uh, began. And so what I'd love to hear, uh, just for those of uh, the readers that uh, haven't been following everything that you've been up to is what are some of the highlights of what you've been able to produce, create, 
and uh, how you've been able to grow since the, the last podcast ended and, and uh, between then and now. Sure. So probably the craziest thing that I did was I wrote 20 books in 20 months. So I wrote three in 2017, right before I ended the show. Um, and then from uh, November of 2017 to February of this year, I wrote the other 13 books. So whatever, some of them are, sometimes I wrote two in one month. So uh, it averaged out to 20 books in 20 months. And just so we're being clear, uh, these are actually real books. Like I, I, I've been on a kick of uh, children's books that are, uh, you know, 50 words long because of my, I, I have a, a almost two year old son at home. And so we read a lot of these, these things, but you're, you're actually talking about uh, novels and nov novellas, right? Yeah. They're somewhere between 25 and 70,000 words long, each of them. Um, some of them, some, most of them are going to be bound into compendiums. So it actually only ends up being something like 12 books. Oh, so, oh yeah. Only 12 books, <laughs> but it's still quite a bit. It's still quite a bit of work. Plus I did a nonfiction book, um, that is coming out. Um, I, well, once this launches, it will officially be out already, um, called, uh, how to become a successful author with all the stuff that I've learned basically since how to build a creative career. I've put together, I want to say eight courses. I had one before. I have a Facebook ads course now, the how to build a rabid fan base course, which, uh, which is sort of like the signature course is all about how to find your perfect customer, make stuff for them, and then like, scale that. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I do a lot of viral giveaways. I have a viral giveaways course. I have another Kickstarter course all about anthologies, uh, because since before when I when I uh, had the show the last year of the show I ran the Monsters and Other Scary Shit anthology, which raised twenty seven thousand dollars. Since then, since I I, uh, I I ended the show last year in September, I did the Cthulhu is Hard to Spell anthology, which raised thirty nine thousand dollars on Kickstarter. And so I have an anthology course uh, and uh, how to write a great novel course for people that want to learn novels and a couple more courses. Plus I have three free courses. One is a free Kickstarter course. One is a free business course. And then one is a, a free audience building course. So I have all three of, of those courses. So there's, and I I've been running this year, a daily blog, uh, which is uh, 2008 every day. I did a, a daily blog about, uh, something about running a creative business. Then I have the complete creative site overall. And, uh, yeah, we just finished in in October third my ninth Kickstarter campaign where we brought uh, Ichabod Jones Monster Hunter, my beloved first series, back from the dead um, to do a new printing of Volume One and then uh, Issue Five as well, and that one raised sixteen thousand seven hundred and eighty dollars. So it's been a busy, uh, it's been a busy last two years. Yeah, I mean that is a tremendous amount of output uh, as, as a creator. Uh, so you know, hats off to you uh, for just everything that you've been able to accomplish. And I'm curious because you mentioned that uh, listeners can get access and and sort of get uh, into all of this over at your site, The Complete Creative, um, that's where they can find the daily blog, access the courses, et cetera. My question for you is, what is your definition right now of a complete creative? I don't know how often I've met somebody who is a complete creative, but it means uh, mindset, creativity, and salesmanship. Somebody who is in the right frame of mind to run their own business, to deal with the highs and lows of being a creator, to um, be able to to have the mental fortitude to withstand the downs as well as the as, as the ups, and just has a good mental outlook on life. It's probably the thing that I struggle with the the hardest. No, it's definitely the thing that I struggle with the hardest. And most creatives, I think, um, have the most trouble with the mindset. And that, part of that is like shifting the mindset to become successful. But then there's another mindset shift, which is, uh, you know, uh, staying successful as well. It's almost like when you're becoming successful, you're running like a nonstop sprint. But once you become successful, you have to understand that it's like 
the 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 things that really like are going to break you into the next tier are long and complicated and there 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 are so many more facets than the things that got you to the place that you were so uh having the right mindset and the website's broken down into this it's the first one is breathe which is mindset and then create which is all about creating great work and being able to do it over and over again and replicate it and then the third is um sales and that is all marketing and sales um it's all of my kickstarter work uh plus the podcast archives plus just a uh, a ton of information about like how to go about becoming like somebody who can generate revenue so there's a common saying that says that uh, the things we teach are the things we most le- need to learn ourselves. Do you agree with that? And has that is that reflected in what people will find when they go to the complete creative? Absolutely. I think those are the three things that I struggle with and have struggled with my whole career. I probably have the least um, least problem with creating stuff. Um, I think that's probably the strength of most creative humans is they are like creators by nature. So the creating comes almost instinctually to them. Um, and then uh, the selling is the thing I have the easiest time with after that. But there's still lessons that I have to remember. I find myself going back sometimes and listening to old episodes of the podcast or um, looking at old blog posts or reading my old epic blog posts. Or I just did uh, the non- the nonfiction book, which collects a lot of the blog posts um, and a little bit of new content together. And just reading through that and the build a creative career book, I was like, oh, yeah, I still I don't do that anymore. I need to get back into doing that. Uh, and then mindset is the hardest thing. So um, I, f- I, f- I find myself constantly looking at uh, books and going on like long walks and trying to find a way to like maintain sanity almost in uh in, in in being able to do this because that's i think that's what ends up separating people is the people that have that can figure out the mental piece over and over and over again are the ones that can withstand all of the doldrums and all of the uh bad stuff to get to those little moments of good and i mean this is not going to be the most uh inspirational part of this i'm sure but like i find that most of most of it is just doldrum it's like 80 percent nothing where like nothing good or bad is happening and then there's like 15 percent of cleaning up messes and five percent of really awesome stuff like the day a kickstarter ends maybe it's a little bit more good maybe it's a little bit more bad maybe there's a little bit less doldrum but um you know the hardest part for me is those days when like nothing is happening and it's incumbent upon you to move a project along where nobody is there's no fire there's no like praise it's just like you sitting alone or with a small group of people trying to figure out how to like move from 51 percent to 53 percent done like there's no um there's no prize for that there's no like uh, there's no eyes on you. It just ends up being you, and the and and the and the work. Yeah, I think there's a lot of creators out there, and probably some of you listening to this right now uh, at your day job that you don't that you don't particularly hate, you don't particularly love, but you have a, this vision that well, one day you'll be able to work for yourself and be a full time creator, right? And that won't that be joyous because you're comparing the uh, the concept of full-time creator with the you know the awesome 2 hour writing sessions where you just feel alive or 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 you know drawing uh, your 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 comic or your graphic novel like on on the weekends around your 9 to 5 and if only i could just spend all my time doing that uh and the reality is <laughs> if you if you do uh get the opportunity to be a full-time creative there's still a lot of things about that job that look like work <laughs> and that feel like work and that are work and aren't, aren't necessarily the, 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 your favorite part of that, uh, of that day, you know? So, so, you know, I, I, I totally hear you there. 
Well, and on top of that, it's some of the some a lot of times the things that you thought were these joyous moments become the doldrums of every day. Like I used to love going to conventions, but after dozens and when people were like, "Oh, I'm so sick of conventions," I'd be like, "What are you talking about? Like you get to basically go and hang out with your friends for like a weekend." And I was like, "Oh, well, like you do thirty of them a year for like five years, and like it's that's the work." And you know, when you're only doing one book a year, it's really exciting to keep. The, it's really it's interesting to keep that that like that uh, that tension built up in yourself for it, the, that excitement. But when you're doing twenty projects at a time and trying to like spin all of the plates, you know that stuff stops being this joyous moment and it starts being like work. You know, launching that Kickstarter project and having it like tip over like twenty thousand dollars. That first time it's like awesome, and that third time it's still good but it's just not quite the same and i was not prepared for that when i started yeah um i mean for me i've actually found that um the you know i i was assuming you know once i had left my day job i was assuming that uh because i had built up comics tribe to you know doing over six figures of in sales like on the side or on the nine to five, I, I was assuming that it would be, you know, super easy to like massively explode that immediately once I could go from, you know, making it my uh, five to nine around my nine to five uh, to working it full time. But what I actually found was that the creativity that re was that the business now required from me um, would actually suck some of the creativity that I would have for my own personal, for my own personal projects. And so like there, it wasn't like I could just work on, you know, you know, you, you can't just work from, you know, wake to go back to sleep and expect for that time to be well spent. And so it, it was definitely adjustment and eye opening period for me, um, sort of transitioning into that. Um, well, what does it look like if, you are making in charge of, you know, deciding, you know, how the business is making money and then also, you know, running, running it so that you actually fulfill on what you decide. And those decisions have big consequences. Like when you focus on what you're fo when you deciding what to focus on becomes like, that's where you're like the decisions you make today are going to decide what, what the bank account looks like, you know, six months to a year from now. And, and that can be, it can be heavy. That is one of the hardest things of this whole thing. I have found is when things are go so what what basically what you're doing now is predictive of like your money in two years by the time like the well, like you start a project the project gets done it fits in a slate like you have it finally out and like you can fudge with that maybe it's a year maybe it's six months like with the Ichabod thing I was able to do it in a couple of months but usually it's predictive of like at least six months out yeah. Because you have to, like, source all of this stuff and, like, get it to a certain place. And, like, I like to have my projects done before I launch them because, like, at least then all I have to – the only failure point is in the printing process and, and the, like, the, the fulfillment process. And I'm, I'm much more okay, uh, uh, like, taking those things than, like, having to actually produce something. So – but it's at least six months. And, like, when revenue starts going down, you have to make a decision. Like, do I keep going while this, like, thing is crashing all around me? Do I, do I give it up, and this project up, and then, like, not have that revenue in six months? And then what happens then? Because once, once the revenue goes down, like, let's say you, you close off, like, doing shows. Well, now you don't have that budgeted for shows anymore. Now you've got to find that budget again. It happened with Ichabod. You know, Ichabod was supposed to go end of life earlier this year. And people were so up in arms about it that I decided to bring it back. But I did not have any Ichabod budget. I did not have any printing budget. Like, it was supposed to be done. And so I had to find basically $16,000 to print more Ichabod and, like, bring it back from the dead. And, you know, my last four months have been all about, like, bringing this one project back. And, like, at the expense of some of my other projects. And just for this one project to hopefully, like, become the thing so that I can put it in my budget. You know, like Cthulhu is hard to spell, like it never came out of my budget. So it was very easy when the second book was was in production, just be like, okay, 
I already have this budget for this book. Um, uh, doing shows, you know, there's a there's a show budget already, but there's not a budget for Amazon ads. So like, where do I, even if that budget could be, even if I could make that much money in Am, uh, to ten grand in Amazon ads, I still have to find that budget now, which means moving money around and finding stuff out. So do you take, do you like end that project when things aren't going well? When things are going great, do you like take that money and reinvest it, even though it might not turn out okay in a year? Yeah. Do or like it, all of these things, like it's so easy to see how companies go bankrupt now. So because these are the, these are like the make or break questions. If you, if you, if you have revenue, and you decide and like things go bad and you cancel that project. Well, it may have been an okay thing, but now instead of making 50 grand, you're making 40 grand or 30 grand. If you're if you suddenly make 100 grand, well, and you reinvest that into a failing company, a failing product, then suddenly you've wasted that whatever $50,000 growth. But if you do well with that one, and every project is sort of different in it almost it makes it easier. It makes it slightly easier to predict which projects to take on, but it 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 like it ingrains in me more and more that like as I continue on a streak of having successful projects, that like that's not normal. You know, Disney fails more times than they succeed in their in their history. You know, I mean, they're probably the greatest entertainment conglomerate that's ever been conceived. And then it makes you think, you know, am I playing it too safe? If that's the case, and and you do look at and 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 what level of risk are you willing to tolerate? And and you know I think that that is one of the things that is powerful about being in this for a while. I think you, you do get a better sense of you know your own confidence in making things work, right? You know, I mean, you, you just wrapped up the Ichabod um, project. And when you say, all right, I have a $16,000 hole in my budget to, and that's what I need to make this happen. Well, I think one of the things that you have confidence in is that you now have developed the skill of being able to raise the funding for your own creative projects. And as a creator, it's not like we have to have the confidence and the ability that we don't just know how to make something, but we know how to cre create the, the funding to make that thing a reality. And those are two sort of uh, two skills that I do. I, I believe the complete creative needs to have. Like you are the creator of your money. You are the creator of the, the and the thing that you're creating. And so what was great about watching you during the last Ichabod campaign is that it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy launch, but you did it and you did whatever it took to make it happen. And, and, and so, you know, I, I, I want to give you a, a big high five. Cause I know, I know that wasn't, a, you know, there are some campaigns that are easier than others. You know, I, I had a campaign uh, last year that I launched like three days after I brought my baby home from, uh, from the hospital. And so I basically <laughs> sent a couple of emails and then outsourced my promotion for that to, to Mark Zuckerberg and was happy to uh, and, and ran it for just two weeks and did very, very little on it. That's but but I, the stakes weren't very high on that one. Um, whereas, I mean, this one was was a higher stake campaign. You knew it was going to be stretching, but you also knew that um, that that it was possible and you knew what it would take to do that. And I think that was a great example of, of basically putting together all of the tricks, all of the strategies, all of the tactics, all of the things that you've learned over the past couple of years and just demonstrated that, you know what, I can make this happen because I'm a complete creative. And so I want to, again, just give you congratulations for that. Well, thank you so much. I actually, I, I agree. That was every trick in my disposal to make that campaign work. But I did know, I said, when I said, should I do 12,000 or 15,000? The campaign goal ended up being 15,666 if you guys are not playing along at home yet. Um, uh, but uh, I, I was like, I can pretty confidently hit 10, maybe 12, but like we really need 16 to make this thing fly. So I made the decision. Even the moment before I hit launch, I was like, I should put it at 12.5. We can do 12.5. It'll be a three, it might be a $3,000 hole in the budget, but like I can absorb $3,000. 
But I was like, no, I'm going to do it for every dollar. And the whole campaign, I was like, oh my God, I should have put it at 12.5. I should have put it at 12.5. I should have put it at 12.5. But due to some luck and a lot of planning and a lot of just what has worked in the past, um, I was able to put that together. And I think you're right. Like uh, it was part of mindset where it's like, I'm not giving up. This is like the hardest struggle I've ever had as a creative pretty much. And uh, I'm not giving up. So it was mindset. It was creating something and making it something that I knew the audience would like so that I could like hammer them. But I'm like, part of the creative process is like when you make something for your fans, you can be like, hey, I'm going to keep hammering you with information about it because like this is for you. Like it's not for me. Like I, 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 I didn't – I wanted Ichabod to go end of life. Like you are the ones who told me, who begged me not to make Ichabod go end of life. So like you – come on. Let's go. Like let's – give me the money. Like let's make this happen. And then the salesmanship to be able to know what you can put in a daily email if you're going to do daily and or even buy daily sometimes how to like line up promotions so they stack on top of each other and how to do all of those things together. I think they really all came together in that campaign in a way that um, they didn't really have to come together in the, in the other campaigns. The, the Pixie Dust campaign was very smooth um, and the Cthulhu is hard to spell campaign like that book basically sells itself. So uh, the last two campaigns uh, were really easy, but it comes from what I learned to, from uh, doing the book launches earlier in this year and how just drastically bad they, they, that they went. So, you know, part of, part of making stuff is knowing that like, especially when you're getting into a new line of business, that you have to start from the bottom and it's going to be very, very, very hard. And you're going to get like killed over and over and over again until you figure it out, which is the, 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 the hard part about being a successful creative is when you want to get into something new, um, you basically have to build that business up from scratch. You know, just because I was successful in comics on Kickstarter did not mean I was going to be successful in books on Amazon. And uh, I was not successful in books on Amazon. So up to this point, uh, but that like constantly being hammered by, you know, low book sales, low book sales, low book sales, low book sales. It helped me like build up, I guess, sort of a resilience to like, oh, well, things have been going pretty well for me for the last couple of years. And like, this is the moment, like this is showing me like, Oh, the other side of the coin. I mean, I wrote 20 books before I started releasing them. And like, I, I think when I did the numbers, I was seven, I've spent about $17,000 on these books and on those 20 books. And I still have about $13,000 over $13,000 to recover. So just cause this is part of being like a creative human. It's like, just you see one huge success, but I see one huge success and like seven epic failures at the same time. And, um, and all of that goes into being a complete human. Like I, I put creative because a complete, complete human is like a, a little too broad, but uh, you know, being a, like, I think it takes a bit of creating a bit, a lot of mindset and some salesmanships to have any success in 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 life at all um especially that mindset part you know i could have in may after like i don't know sixth consecutive horrible launch that i had in a row uh i could have just folded it up but instead i said no let me go back and look at my most successful properties um and i i went through i had already written four books in the gods verse universe which is katrina hates the dead and pixie dust and then four novels so I was like, I'm going to wait on that one and see how that plays out once I've released all of them. Uh, I, the Monsters and Other Scary Shit became the second Cthulhu is Hard to Spell. And, I, so I put, uh, and, and so I put a second Cthulhu is Hard to Spell book into production because that was very successful. Um, and then I, uh, I um, looked at Ichabod, my other most successful property, which was going end of life, and said, okay, like I'm willing to take a chance on this one. And this will be like my number one priority my number one or two priority after Cthulhu is hard to spell those two one one and one a uh, and and those are going to be the ones and that is what I what having a successful career allows you to do is really look back and say okay these are the things and knowing your audience so well you get to look back and say these are the things that they love 
these are the things that I love and how can we make this thing together that is going to not just make me money, but be able to sustain for years to come. Mm. So we talked about the importance of mindset and building yourself as a creator and building yourself as a salesman. What's something that's easy for you now that definitely felt like a struggle a few years ago? Everything. Everything felt like a struggle where, so it's, it's hard to, I have people come up and ask me all the time, like, how did you get the idea for this? And like, it's just so innate now. It's just so innately possible for me to be like, well, it just came or, you know, it's like walking. It's like, I don't know how I walk. I just put one foot in front of the other. And it's almost hard to separate those things out. But even a few years ago, and this will be years before the, 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 even the business of art, about 2000 and I was 32. So five years ago, four or five years ago, I was like bad, very bad at sales. I was very bad at communicating with people and being like pleasant and personable. Uh, you know, my wife, uh, everyone loves my wife. She's like, yeah, but like, I don't talk to a lot of people. You talk to everybody. I was like, yeah, but for years, everyone hated me. <laughs> like I was just like not nice. I was not pleasant. I was not somebody people wanted to be around and all of that. I had to, uh, to like work and mold. Um, uh, the, the rejection part of it a few years ago was probably the hardest thing for any creator, right? That like, um, this was many years ago. So this was like eight or nine, uh, probably like 2013 or 14 when I first started like really trying to sell my work not somebody else's work. Uh, it was so hard to like stand there and be rejected constantly, like in person, because you were at a convention, you couldn't even like put it off from like a no, like you could just look at people looking through you. That is, that was, that was probably the hardest thing overall in my whole career. The hardest thing to learn was how to get knocked down and get back up. Mm. Uh, that first time it took years. I mean, you actually, we like the first time it happened was for my first company. And you told me, a story uh, a couple of years ago, maybe last year, or maybe even this year, earlier this year, where it's like, it's like, oh yeah, we met at this time. He goes, no, we didn't meet then. We met years before that. And I was like, what do you mean? Hmm. Like, you were trying to put together a movie back in DC. And we met uh, uh, as like, I, you were looking for writers and people to do short stories. And like, we met then. I was like, that was my first company. And when that failed, it took years, years to get back up off the mat and try again. Yeah, that's, uh, it's definitely something that, um, I mean, I, I think that is one of the things that you'll, you'll hear, uh, from the folks that you talk about, uh, with, uh, how do you maintain this thing is, is just building up that resilience to the point where, you know, the thing strangers say to you ain't nothing, <laughs> the, you know, even giving negative, negative critical feedback, just keep it, you, you keep on rolling. Curious, what, what's something that feels like a struggle right now, but that you're working on to hopefully make be not something that's, you know, that there's something that you can brush off the same way that you can brush off that, you know, inability to get off the mat, um, in the future. I mean, I deal with severe anxi anxiety and depression every day, you know, for the first six months of this year, I was, I, 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 I once told my wife that I was glad I didn't have a gun cause I would shoot myself with it for sure. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, I deal with that stuff on a, daily basis and trying to so the thing that I'm struggling with now is the same stuff I struggled with um, years ago but years ago I had something to prove now I don't think I have anything to prove like I honestly feel like like I've, I've had a career yeah. I've had a career's worth of stuff that is like done and come out so um, the hard part for me is being like okay now where does the motivation to to live come from I know that's very depressing, but like, it's true. Like, that's what I struggle with to, to like every single day of every single hour of, of, of the day. Like, how do you keep your head up in a world that seems determined to beat you down, even when things are good? In fact, like things are good. It's like, just give me the one day, just give me the one day. Don't like constantly put the bad on top of the good. Just let me have the one good week. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, 
that part is 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 really 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 hard um so when that flares it's when that flares up like when it when it hits and it's it's like you're in your head and and you know i i, I don't know what your how that manifests particularly in, in in your situation but like what do you do like what is your process to get out of that space so that you can do the things you were actually put here to do and i when i'm in writing mode it's very easy because then i i like dump it all onto the page like i can just i can just dump it and flush it all out um because i don't write as nearly as much as i do it requires a lot of i mean the stuff that they always tell you like long walks uh music uh going to movies like trying to like pattern interrupt the thing that has really helped as i've become more successful is that like objectively i'm i'm, I'm wrong objectively I'm, I'm wrong like it's like well it can't possibly be that no one likes you like to look at like you've had so much success in your career like are you saying that these people are stupid or wrong or like and you're like, no, I would never say that about them. It's like, well, then you have to objectively, like, understand that, like, you're, you can't be bad. Like, you can't, like, put a lot of good out in this world and, like, you are, you're needed here. Uh, and you can, like, you can, I can objectively, like, look at emails of people and remember instances and podcast appearances and, and little snippets of, like, of, of, like, thanks that people have left me almost daily now to like remind me of that objectively like i have to be wrong and that's that for me is the powerful motivator now i i still have those like what is the point but then like i'll get like an email from somebody or uh talk to somebody and I'd be like oh that is the point point. one of the things that i, I really am excited to do uh, when i bring this uh, you know bringing the show back is have an hour to dedicated to like talking to somebody that I respect that is doing the same thing as me like every single week um, as a creator, especially doing it full time. I mean, you are on the high end of, 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 of communicating with humans uh, because you've had a podcast for so long and you have the comics launch group and everything and you do all the live stuff, but um, it's very isolating. You know, my office is in my house. My wife works from home a couple of days a week, but otherwise gets pretty silent here. So yeah. uh, having that outlet to be able to talk to somebody or just not about like even that stuff, just like to talk to somebody that you respect or that you like about whatever it is. I happen to really like talking about like building creative businesses and like, and uh and like the depression and anxiety and all the things we've talked about and like how to get your mindset right and and uh, how to share your work more like that's the stuff that like i like geeking out about as well as like books and stuff but mostly it's about like how to build this kind of thing and like how to sustain it and like how to get into the right mindset to do it and so but whatever it is that like you grok to that that is the thing that i'm I, I mean, take an hour out of the out of your week to just do that with somebody. It is incredibly helpful. Do not do not talk about the things that make you stress stress. So like, don't go and complain about like your job at work. Just like talk about something that you love with somebody that you respect um, or you want to get to know better. And I also will often just uh, message somebody out of the blue just to have a conversation because like then i'm it's that connection uh, i think we lose that connection too often and i don't have the same problems with i mean i have the problems with what mark zuckerberg has done with facebook but i don't have like the problems inherent with facebook that most people have like my feeds of my social medias are filled with like art and like people that inspire me and like and and that that is helpful and um then also to know that, you know, life tends to show you the best days of other people. And that's probably not the best day. That's probably like not their true light. And they're probably also dealing with something 
that that may be incredibly painful for them and they don't want to share or they might just be um you know when i was starting out as a creative i would always be like well, why is that why does that guy have to complain about like what does that person have to complain about and it's like well life like life even for the best of us are like you know we've all had our britney spears uh, shave off her head moments or uh or our demi lovato like od on dr like whatever like we all have those moments because like life's really, really hard. And so when I have to think about that for myself, um, you know, it bums me out because like everyone's dealing with a huge struggle, but it also is helpful to know that um, like it's not just you. When my dad died, which is um, about two years ago, like the next week, pretty much the next week or two weeks later, I ended the podcast. I didn't record another uh, episode after my dad died, except for the end, the, the end. But I forget the exact day that I ended it. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the day, the week, that my, the day my father died, I went to LA Comic Con. And I, ha I had a table that whole weekend, which seems like it would be horrible. But I just found hundreds of people that came to my table that that like wished me well that told me their stories about how like their dad died or their mom died or something horrible happened and they just carried on and i realized that like the fact that the world doesn't fall apart every day is a miracle because everybody that i talked to i was like wow i thought everything was going so good at that point in your life and he's like yeah well it was going okay, but then like my dad died or something horrible happened or, um, yeah. So I, I don't know. Like I, I've been thinking a lot about connection recently and how like the first move I ever directed was called connections. And it's amazing how it keeps coming back to that in my life. Just the connections that you make and how to make them last and how to like appreciate them and how at the end of the day if all this went away like the thing that i would have besides the work it's like the work and the connections that's all that's it that's that's all that the people who would remember me are the connections and the things that i did is the work and like with uh, those two things are kind of like all all i'm gonna leave and all any of us can leave so i try and make both of them last yeah i mean it's it things like losing a parent losing uh or or success or failure like they they do remind you of how fleeting this stuff all is and you know i'm i'm obviously getting out on my end by seeing how fast my my boy is growing up and and um you know the the concept of like a, the complete creative is kind of thing where like w when i see him i see him right now as like a complete creative like he is a complete, like he can sell me on what he wants. He can be creative. He can be a thing, uh, you know, and, and he just is, is like this it comes out like that. And I think we go through this process of, of forgetting all of that stuff and then having to remind us uh, of it and, and build it back up. Um, and, and so like a lot of times, especially when creators are dealing with like not good enough, worthy enough, uh, you know, and, and all of those, those issues, not loved, et cetera. Like to get to the point where we are right now, someone somewhere had to sort of love us unconditionally, had to take care of us unconditionally, had to get us, you know, just, just to be there. And, and so, you know, I, I would say a lot of us, you know, we were worthy of it then we're worthy of it now. And to, when we get caught up in ourselves, just remember that, like that, that, you know, we're here and, and, and then also we get the opportunity to pay that forward. And that's something that you've definitely done. And, and so one of the things that I think is a hallmark of, of your show, but also all of the stuff that you put out into the world, um, blogs and anytime you're an interviewer, uh, anything is, is that you are extremely open about sharing like the behind the scenes of your business and the highs and lows, both personal and professional. Um, and I know that a lot of that stuff is going to make its way podcast going forward and so um sort of as we're coming to the end here like what are some big things that you're working on now and and in the next heading into 2020 in your creative business that listeners can expect to hear you talk about on the show so um early next year i'm going to do my first big novel kickstarter campaign i'm going to take the books that 
So the, there are multiple books that failed when I launched them earlier this year. Um, six, six uh, of the God's first book. So I, I, I want to st- I want to stop for a second because you've called those books th- that book launch a failure, but that's a label that you get to put on, and and it be, and and you're basing that failure based on they haven't made their money back. Is that correct to say? That is correct. I should say that I've talked to some people who like. Uh, are like I would love to have that. Those book sales would be like my best book launch of all time. And, and isn't it true that th- those sales are are at least for fiction better than your previous Amazon or, or Kindle or, or wide launches by pretty significant margins? Yeah, I've made over a thousand dollars more this year just on Amazon than I did in all platforms last year. So, um, so yes, on like, but in like i'm still negative in these books they are like i'm still underwater on them they are still failures in my eyes because like i don't do that but yes theoretically i've sold and 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 at shows i brought them to shows and they always sell out at shows um what so it's not a failure of the book it's just a failure of the process that i used to launch and yes failure for me is like determined much differently than anybody else you know many but i think that's true for anybody that uh i judge my time and i'm like oh i didn't even make enough to cover like my time that's like it hurts for me because i mean i judge my time and like how much time i take away from my wife to be like here and my family to be here and like do this thing and when it's like 20 months of your life that you could have been spent doing other stuff like that, that, that psychologically matters to me. But, um, I did really want those books to break even in the first couple of months of launch and they have not, but they have done very well when I'm sitting at a table. So my theory is that, um, so sitting at a convention table, so conventions and Kickstarter actually are very, uh, are very, uh, intertwined as far as, uh, the the audience that goes to both, they tend to be people who don't see what they want in the mainstream, and they're going to conventions uh, to find like weirder stuff, or they're going to um, or they're going to uh, Kickstarter to find stuff that like they can't get in like on Amazon easily. So why Lovecraft is so popular on Kickstarter and so not popular everywhere else because like that is a community of people who want this thing. And that, but it's, it's a big group, but it's a big group that are passionate, but they're like at conventions and at shows, but Lovecraft in the general like world is not very popular as far as like, like, as far as like genres, it's even, um, so, but, uh, so it also skews your perception of what works on other platforms. Mm. So if you're, if you're building your career on, on Kickstarter and on, um, and on uh, and on uh, conventions, you can absolutely do that. There's a place for it. I know because I've done it. But the things that work at conventions are probably not going to work the same on Amazon because it's a different beast. It's a different kind of person. These are people, the people on Amazon are people who do find what they want on Amazon. They're much more towards the center of the weirdness bell curve so uh the uh the things that I was writing, and like when you go to a convention, I was just at a convention uh in uh in Utah, and everyone was saying they like fantasy or sci fi i didn 't talk to one person, maybe two people that said they liked romance, and they mostly did it like with their head down like in shame mm. um didn 't talk to anybody who did mysteries or thrillers, maybe like two or three people there as well um nobody who did lit fiction. Uh, so, and that, those are the three biggest categories on Amazon. Like those are, those are the three biggest book selling categories is thriller, romance, and like literary fiction. So you're, you're taking your, your, and, and, uh, based on my convent, my convention com- communications, uh, sci-fi and fantasy, sci-fi and fantasy should be the easily biggest categories on Amazon, but they are not. So what I did was I wrote books for the Kickstarter and 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 convention audience and that audience is not the same as the amazon audience so when i brought the books and i launched them on amazon i was launching the wrong product to the wrong market 
Instead, I should have been launching those weirder books into a Kickstarter market because that is who built those books with me. Right. So um, I'm going to test in January whether those books, the four books that I that I made, five books, I guess, that I made sort of with the Kickstarter community in mind, mm -hmm. uh, work on Kickstarter. I've recovered two of the, the two that have I've I've taken the six books that I launched in the God's verse and I've combined them into two sort of omnibuses and I've retitled them and recovered them so that they look different. They've been re-edited to have less cursing in them because I've been told many times that the book said too much cursing. And then I'm going to bring those two books, my book, Worst Thing in the Universe, and then uh, two brand new novels, one from Okta's perspective and one from one of her descendants' perspective to Kickstarter in January and test this theory that it wasn't the uh, books – or even the methodology, or even the methodology that was the problem. It was the combination of books and the market that I was trying to launch them into. Right, and also the the audience that you've been building aggressively, potentially. Uh, you know, whereas most of your customer base is, has been, you know, over the prior to that launch is probably uh, Kickstarter and and conventions. And so, um, I, I think you, you know, convention. Convention folks like to buy books at conventions. Kickstarter people like to buy them at Kickstarter. Kindle readers like to buy on Kindle, um, and and so you know that th that may have uh, led to it as well. But I'm I'm excited to see what this uh, this experiment uh, comes out because um, I I, th I think you're you're making some good moves there, and you're you're realizing that uh, even if if the the initial launch didn't uh, succeed, you you have an asset there, and often <laughs> like I, I don't know many products that um are instantly profitable uh and the profits all often in the in the relaunch as i'm looking at my my latest version of the iphone and like and all of the iterations there it's it's about it's about uh building assets and relaunching so i think uh you, you're, you're taking the right tactic uh for that next launch yeah that's one of the best things with um i think that's one of the best things about having products is like now i can go back into a library of books and know that like I made them one time, like you make them one time and then you can sell them forever. And so I'm doing that, I'm trying to do that with novels. I do have a novel that I created with a group of my beta readers who are um, who are, like are Amazon readers and people who are, do not fit into the Kickstarter and, uh, and, um, and convention mold. I'm gonna try and launch that next year, hopefully as well. Uh, so that will be a new series that is basically uh, much more romance, much more in the uh, in the in the Amazon wheelhouse of what like paranormal romance and uh, and, and fantasy is on Amazon's platform, uh, and so I'm going to do that as well and see if I can put some more money behind it and uh, and and make that one work. And then I have the second Cthulhu is hard to spell book, the Terrible Twos, that is coming out next year early in the. This is all. The, the 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 not the new novel series but the other two are um are uh, are coming out basically the first quarter of next year i'm going to run like a 10 day quick starter campaign for the novels try and fulfill them really quickly and then be ready for the uh, march launch of the cthulhu is hard to spell 2 and just a lot more testing you know my new theory is um, that I just need to understand the platform I'm going to launch books on bet better and then make books and products for that specific audience. And so if I'm going to launch it on Kickstarter, I'm going to make it in a certain way. If I'm going to launch it on Amazon, I'm going to launch it in a certain way. Depending on where I launch it, it's going to change sort of not the quality of it, just the overall direction for it to maximize that platform and make people on that platform stand up and take notice. Awesome. I think that's a great plan. Um, before we wrap up, what's what one question that you wish I asked you? Oh, man. We went, we covered so much. I don't even remember what you did ask me or didn't ask me. I think that you covered it all, though. Um, the, I guess the one question that I usually end on is, uh, give me one piece of advice. It could be the, the, something that you said before or something that, uh, that, uh, is new that you want people to take away from, you know, like people are, 
yeah so so to so to put a reframe and to put a button on it if if people walk away and they have just one thing that they take away from this conversation what do you hope that is you are in it for the next 40 years you are in your career for the next 40 years and while it is important to make strides every day it is also important to understand that your that, that your entire life will be built around this career and you need to treat it as such if you're an artist that means taking care of your body it means not doing 50 pencils in a day and it means knowing that you're going to uh, have to be in that chair for the next few decades uh, on a good life on like a, assuming you can do this um if you're a writer it means that speed is important when you're writing and getting as much stuff out there as possible but so is your mental state it means you know not burning yourself out all like running on both ends like i know that you have to get a project done but guess what's going to happen the minute you get this project done there's a new one that comes there'll be a new one and a new one and a new one it will literally never end it will not and it also means being judicious with the projects you do take at the beginning i think that it's important to take as many projects as possible and try as many things as possible but once you have sort of an aesthetic and a thing that you like, it's much more important to say no to as many things as you possibly can so you can focus on the things that are going to move the needle the most. Because just a couple of projects, I mean, look at Hellboy. Like Hellboy, like Mike Mignola's Hellboy or Spawn, like they were, a, they have made a career and they put all of their effort into those projects once they once they hit and yes they did other stuff but like they put the foot down they put put their foot down on the gas and made sure that there was room for that project in their life so it is a 40 year marathon it is not a 40 year sprint and it's important to remember the short term and the long term when it comes to that. I think that's a great place to leave this. I want to again welcome you back to podcasting. I have already gone and resubscribed to the now the new Complete Creative podcast. Uh, I, I listen to my podcast on iTunes. So if anyone is catching this and hasn't done that already on the place that they listen to their uh, podcasts. I believe you're you're everywhere, so uh, definitely go and do that. But uh, thanks so much for having me on the show to interview you, Russell, on your own show. Appreciate that, and I'm looking forward to hearing you uh, for uh, many, many weeks to come. So that was Tyler James interviewing me about The Complete Creative and what it takes to lead a complete creative life. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, you can expect a whole lot more as we continue on with The Complete Creative. I'm so, so, so excited to be back, and I can't wait to bring you our first new guest next week in Marv Wolfman. If you enjoyed this show, please head on over and tell Tyler how much you liked it by subscribing to the Comics Launch Podcast. And while you're on your favorite app, subscribe to Rate and Review the Complete Creative as well. And if you want even more, head on over to thecompletecreative.com and get our podcast archive, epic blog posts, free courses, paid courses, and a whole lot more. That's it for me. I'll see you next time.